Tonight we're in Dulwich and welcome to Question Time. And with me tonight, Kwasi Kwarteng, part of the Treasury team under Philip Hammond, a Brexiteer, he won't like me saying this, seen as by some as a future leader of the Tory party. Diane Abbott, a Shadow Home Secretary, an MP for more than 30 years, one of Jeremy Corbyn's closest advisers. Mairead McGuinness, the first Vice President of the European Parliament. Uh, since 2017, she's been in that job, an MEP for the Irish Finn Gael Party since 2004. Uh, David Aronovich, writer, broadcaster, columnist for the Times newspaper. And the Canadian psychologist whose self-help book has sold two million copies and whose speaking tour excites controversy wherever he goes, Jordan Peterson. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And as ever on Question Time, uh, if you're watching at home, you can be part of the argument. Uh, we, we're on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, our hashtag is hashtag BBCQT. Now, let's have our first question, which comes from Kate Putnam, please. Should stronger use of stop and search powers be employed to tackle our current knife crime epidemic? Well, as we know, there's an appalling spate of knife crime in London and other big cities. Should stronger use of stop and search help? Quasi Kwarteng. Look, I don't think that stop and search is the only answer. But clearly there has to be some degree of uh, the police uh, being able to do their job, being able to uh, try and prevent uh, crimes. Uh, we have a problem. Uh, certainly in London, the mayor has identified a problem. I was very surprised to see that he said it would take 10 years to fix it, and I don't think that inspires any confidence in anybody. But we have a problem. The Home Secretary has, uh, uh, has brought it up. He's also in discussions with my boss, the Chancellor, to make sure that we get the right provision, the right amount of money and resource so that we can tackle this problem. But I don't think it's helpful, mayors of London, saying it'll take 10 years or a generation uh, to solve the problem. I don't think that, that makes any sense. Would it help to have more police? I think... Being cut back over the last 10 years? Resources are, are an issue, but we have to remember that... Uh, when we came in, people don't like me saying this, but when we came in in 2010, we had the biggest peacetime deficit in this country's history. We took tough choices. We've made a lot of those choices. And now, as you saw in last week's budget, we've got more resource to put into vital public services. But this is an ongoing debate. We're going to have a comprehensive spending review next year, and a lot of the decisions will be made there. But hang on, you mean there's a, a trade-off between people stabbing each other and the deficit? No, what I'm saying is that the, in terms of public spending, you understand that we do not have a bottomless pit of money. Well, it's your choice, we don't isn't have, it? We have to make choices. We made 20 billion uh, pledge to the NHS, which was widely uh, received and welcome. And I think that was the right thing. Right. With policing, we've got to uh, allow the police to do their job. And the question, Kate's question, was about stop and search. And I think we've got to allow them to do their job and have the, give them authority to do that. Diane Abbott. Well, um, <clears throat> we just heard that uh, the Tory party don't have a magic money tree, but they found the money to pay off the DUP, and I believe they should find the money to fund the police properly. On the question of stop and search, the Home Office's own research has shown that stop and search in itself doesn't bring down levels of crime. Evidence-based stop and search is one thing, and I support that, and the Labour Party supports it, but random stop and search, there's no evidence that that bears down on crime, including knife crime. But what you do need is more policemen, both to patrol, to engage with the community, to get the information, because very often these stabbing, it's not a complete secret who's done it, but people need to come forward. And you need more police to work with the community. I think we need to look at what's happening in schools. You've got extremely high levels of expulsions in some of these South London boroughs. And these children that are expelled and end up in people, pupil referral units, that's often a straight line to criminal activity. We also need to look at youth provision. So many youth clubs have been closed down under austerity. And finally, more broadly and perhaps more long term, we need to look at providing jobs for some of these young people. But it's not true there isn't the money. The money was found for other things. And to say that it's going to take a generation, I've sat with people whose sons have been stabbed to death. We cannot afford to write off 
a generation of young people and to write off the fears of the community. So there's more that needs to be done and it will take money and more policemen. So, uh, Sadiq Khan, the Labour mayor, was wrong to say it would take up to ten years. Let's just say I'm disappointed. I won't write off what do you a mean generation that he's not, of our children. What do you mean that he's not meeting the challenge that London faces? This is about families and people and communities to say we're going to, you know, that it'll take a generation anyway. In Glasgow, where they have been quite successful in bringing down levels of knife crime, they did it in less than a generation. Uh, David Aronovich. I should rather commend Sadiq Khan for saying this is a difficult thing and it's not going to be easy. I know, I know, I know that people always... I know that it's politically difficult if you say to people something's going to take some time, but this is... I mean, I don't want to take issue with Kate Putnam's question, but if ever there was a multifactorial issue, the question of violent knife crime in London is it. People have blamed drill music, they blame gangs, they blame drugs, they blame stop and search, not enough stop and search, it's, it's a police cuts, youth clubs being closed, school exclusion. And the probability is that each of those things plays some small part in the problem of why we've got such a big knife crime problem here. But we also know that it affects certain people far more than it affects others. Most of us, and most of our children, are not likely to be put a hazard by this at all, uh, unlike what uh, uh, I think Michael Gove's wife wrote in the mail recently, where she said she thought her son was a hazard. I think that's extremely unlikely. So we do know roughly where the problems are, but the thing is, it's a very intractable question. And so the Violence Reduction Unit, set up by Sadiq Khan on the Glasgow model, with the agreement, incidentally, of the Home Secretary, will be probably the best way in which we can deal with it, dealing with knife crime mm. as a public health issue. But it could take some time. It's not going to be instant. What, or you could flood the streets. I didn't say it could be done instantly. Look, what, about, what about... You didn't mention the race issue, because the statistics show that carrying knives, using knives, being killed by knives, has a racial dimension to it, that 50% of... or two-thirds, two -thirds, I think, of knife offenders under 25 were black or minority yeah, but ethnic. I don't, I don't, is, that a, is that a I don't, factor I don't think people look at themselves in the mirror and say, I'm black, therefore I'm going to carry a knife, uh, and so on. So probably the reason for this has got much more to do with the kinds of uh, circumstances within which people live and the neighbourhoods within which they live, rather than actually what the colour of their skin is. People forget that before Glasgow took the action it did, Glasgow was the knife crime capital of this country, and that's got to do with the collapse of heavy industry and all sorts of issues. At the end of the day, as David said, it's not someone looking in the mirror and saying, I'm black, I'm going to stab someone. There's all sorts of quite complicated factors at work. Are you sitting in the middle of the audience there? Yes. I think it's, it, it, especially around here, it's gang-related, and I think, I think you, cert you certainly don't, and I'm missing the point, that if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to lose, and stop and search is probably the only way around here you're going to do it. All right, and you, and you in the front here. Uh, I'm coming from this from two perspectives. I work with young people, and I've got a 17-year-old son, and we live literally two minutes away from the stabbing in Clapham South last week. And stop and search is important, but in regards to gang-related, it's not always gang-related. The young man that was stabbed, I know two young ladies, they're the friends of mine, their children go to that college, and that young man, according to them, was not in a gang, OK? I know of people, my friend's son last year was stabbed, he was not in a gang, and he was killed. So saying it's gang-related is not true. Mm. Secondly, as I said, I also work with young people and they're not all in gangs, but some of them are very scared, so they do walk with a knife. Now, as a parent of a 17-year-old son, for me, on one hand, you know, I feel like, okay, stop and search needs to be done. But at the same time, my son has been stopped and searched just going to the shop. Yeah. OK, yeah. because he's a 17 year old and he might be wearing a tracksuit and whatever. And he shouldn't be made to feel that he can't walk down the road to his local shop. Mm. Now, the issue with stop and search is not about stop and search. It's about who they're stopping and searching and why. And in regards to race and, and, and profiling, but it's also about it being done properly within the guidelines of the law. And I've seen and 
um, spoken to young people and been and seen situations where they're stopped and searched, and it's not done within the, the parameters of the law. So that is the issue. It's not so much of the stop and search. It's about how it's being done and why. Does he, does he, uh, has he ever said he feels he should carry a knife for his own protection? When we've spoken, he's spoken about when he was younger, he's, he's felt that way because it, it's scary out there. So I do get it. And, and lots of young people that I've spoken to, you know, who may have carried knives, it's not because they want to kill somebody. It's because they're scared of being stabbed themselves. You know, this issue is so, like you said, it's multifaceted. There's not one solution, but definitely the police cuts does make a difference. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Well, if you're, if you're approaching this problem from the perspective of a social scientist, what you'd try to do is to track down the multi-factors that are at play. You know? So who's doing it? That, that, would, that would be age range primarily and likely gender because the probability that it's all males is extremely high. Um, why are they doing it? Why has it accelerated in recent years? What do they gain from it? That's a, that's a major element of it there's there's some there's something going on there is it self-protection is it status and so you want to do a causal analysis of the problem and then you can target the solution properly and the problem with like stop and search for example and this has already been touched upon is that um, these are low probability events so you end up stopping and searching a far larger number of people than are ever going to be involved in any crime and then that produces side effects like accusations of racism or perhaps actual racism seen that sort of thing happen in New York and in Toronto when, when stop and search and that, you know, and now analogs of that were attempted to be implemented. But I'd like to know why it's happening. That's the first thing, because it's hard to solve a problem unless you've got the diagnosis right. Okay. <laughs> well, well. Surely it's got to come down to early intervention. Surely. Mm -hmm. um, the Early Intervention Foundation yesterday released its report suggesting it's going to take 25 years. It, will, it, it would be a good thing to have a 25-year plan. Now, that's long term. That's, where is the government that is going to be brave enough to say, right, come on, let's all work in a cross-party way. Let's, put this, let's make, not make this party political. Let's make this cross-party and let's put the time and effort and money into early intervention measures. I can't see that anybody could disagree with that. Okay. Mary McGuinness. Well, what strikes me is that if the answer was stop and search, then it would be in place and there wouldn't be a problem. I think it's actually a very minor part. That's just my instinct on this. It would find knives, perhaps, but it might not stop murders. What strikes me generally is that I think society is angry I think there's a lot of anger out there, perhaps frustration, and I'm listening to the youth worker who spoke earlier about her own child, which is very strange. So you're afraid because he has a knife, you have to have a knife. So everybody has knives and some are using them. Um, and I've been very aware of this because it's such big news that so many families, and we haven't mentioned the victims, but the families that are affected by a murder, it is just horrific for those families. So I think I would support Diane in saying, let, let it not be a generation, but I think in all our societies, we have a problem where early intervention might work if we put more resources into it. And I think that's of all countries as well. So I think that it depends on political pressure. If society believes this problem needs to be tackled and tackled effectively, then the political pressure should be put on to address it. And as, you, as uh, Jonathan said, we need to find the root cause here, but anger and frustration seems to be part of it. You saw up there with spectacles on, and then I come to you up there. Yes. One solution must be to have a sensible approach to drugs policy in this country. For too long, we've not looked to follow the evidence, and we need a real consideration of legalisation and regulation, um, which must be one answer as part of a suite of uh, solutions here. Why do you say that? Um, well, f you know, for too long, um, we've, you know, politicians haven't been willing to face up to the evidence on drugs policy, um, and uh, it's been illiberal um, and illogical. And I think, um, yeah, it, we must have a, a national debate uh, with politicians willing to um, take a sensible approach to this. Are you? A, a, would like to see legalisation of drugs uh, think, uh, to, to stop. Criminal gangs, is that what you're... I think it must about? be linked. I don't think it's the only thing, yeah, but yeah. I, I think, um, yes. OK, and you sit up there in the second row from the back. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Um, so I think that stop and search is more like a comfort blanket for people looking in at the issue. Because um, as research shows that it doesn't actually reduce the amount of crime. And then we can see that there's something else. Um, the areas where this is happening are more deprived areas. And we can see in the last few years, as um, austerity and different things, um, sorry, austerity has affected these areas, um, poverty has increased more. So um, knife crime and other type of violent crimes have also increased. We can see area inside um, Glasgow, which was a few years ago, the knife crime capital of Europe. Um, which wasn't just black people that was doing the crimes over there, that this is something that affects lots of um, poor, um, poor areas. And I think it's very easy when you're not the people who are being stopped and, uh, and harassed by the police, because I'm from Peckham, and I've experienced the harassment that the police get, um, do when they do stop and search. And it's not very nice, and it just aggravates um, the way that you feel towards the police and so on as well. Okay. You see... Um, the So gen generally speaking, the people who are most likely to be violent are young men. And the violence that, that, that drives young men is often a consequence of status competition. And so one of the things that you see is that when societies are structured so that young men have a hard time finding a route to status that's, that's say, positive and, and properly social, that they'll turn to status contests that are violent. And so that's another element to doing the causal analysis properly is that if violent crimes on the rise, the probability is high that young men who are ambitious are having a hard time moving up the status hierarchy and, and then they use other means to, to attain uh, notoriety even. And that can be a powerful psychological you agree with that? I think that's partly true, but I think we can overanalyze what's actually going on in the sense that um, crimes that are happening are affecting people every single day. I mean, I read there were about 119 people that were killed in London. That's completely unacceptable. And to say that it'll take a generation as the mayor, or 10 years, as the mayor was suggesting, uh, I think is really defeatist. I think if you look around the world, if you look at Glasgow, as Diane mentioned, good policing, good policy, locally uh, driven, we've got police uh, and crime commissioners, uh, locally, they can solve things. I mean, Rudy Giuliani didn't come to New York as the mayor and say, it'll take me 25 years to deal with but, crime. But he dealt took, with it, he it, dealt with it in, in a relatively short time. I don't took, think... It took I, 10 years in Glasgow. I don't think it... it that's how long it... That's how I don't long think it it'll they take... They started their programme in 2005. And, 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 and it wasn't now it's obvious. Getting... It wasn't obvious why, why crime fell in New York. Like, it's fallen quite precipitously across, but across North broadly, America. broadly, I do not think it is an acceptable thing for a politician to say it'll take a generation. What do you make Fair of enough. the point that Jordan made, that it's uh, ambition frustrated by lack of opportunity? I think, I think there are a huge number of reasons um, why people... What about that particular reason I don't, I that think, he I think, there is, I think there is a plausibility to it. I think that's completely right. I think people feel, they feel safer, they feel stronger, they feel um, a sense of, 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 of worth, perhaps, sometimes. But I don't think that getting into sociological reasons is actually going to solve the problem as effectively as people would like to see on the street? Just, just two things quickly. One of the most frightening things I've read recently about knife crime is that surgeons in hospitals like King's are saying the people that are coming in with this vicious stabbing, they're getting younger and younger, and the peak time for the stabbing is at the end of the school day. Yes. But just the other thing about ambition and status, it's no coincidence, I think, that some of the areas in London with the biggest gang stroke knife problem, Tottenham, Peckham, Hackney, Brent, were areas when I was a child, there was ample work for blue collar men to do in factories and manufacturing. And as employment has collapsed, for some people in our society, you're seeing, I think, a but, rise in but gangs as well. But employment, I'm not levels saying it's are, employment levels are massively higher now. Yes, but it's the type of the case jobs. Which, you know, it's the type of jobs. Years the ago. type of jobs which working class men could do when I was a child no longer exist in London. That's my point. The jobs are there, but not the jobs for these young men. All right. The, the woman here. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only person in the audience who is rather sick of politicians not being truthful. I think Sadiq Khan was actually just trying to express an honest view about how long a very complicated problem gets to be resolved properly. 
Now, of course, it's not a politically particularly successful thing to say because it will disappoint very many people. But equally, I would like to ask, you know, what are we doing about schooling? What are we doing about supporting very hard-working <coughs> single parents who are struggling to bring food into the house, therefore cannot be around for some of their young children when they are growing up? Thank you. assumptions and generalisations as to why the knife crime is happening and to who it's happening and where it's happening. But unless we find out the real reason why, we can't solve anything. We can't solve the issue without finding out why it's really happening. OK. And you, sir, on the gang with there? I, I think it's really disappointing that, that we're having yet another hand-wringing debate without a single mention of the concept of punishment. And I know... I know, that, I know I'm probably being very old-fashioned, but punishment does actually work. Even in Glasgow, it worked. And what happened in Glasgow, they put the, uh, the, average, the average sentence went up. They tripled the average sentence for, for, for going around with a knife. They tripled it from four months to 13 months. Imagine how quickly we could turn things around if instead of 13 months, it was 15 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's for people who carry knives. <laughs> for, 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 for people, for people, for, for, for people, and don't forget, it is a particular breed of human being that can repeatedly put a knife into another person, and those people should be dealt with like the cancer they are, and they should be exterminated. Wow. Well, so, so the person in the front here, what are you saying? Hold on, let's get a mic in front of you. Again, yeah. to, to echo the gentleman's point just before, why isn't the Shadow Home Secretary mentioning about harsher sentences? The gentleman back there just before hit the nail right on the head. He said they should be exterminated. No, not that <laughs> point, not that <laughs> point. The oh, harsher Dan, sentences. Yeah. Hello, I'll come to you, Dan. One of the reasons I didn't mention about harsher sentences is very recently was either, I was with a group of young people discussing knife crime, and I said to them, if the sentences were longer, would that be a deterrent? And you know, a lot of them said no. It's, I mean, I'm not saying that we don't detect, catch, imprison, penalise, but the idea that long sentences in themselves, given all the complicated issues around this, will solve the problem, I don't think it's true. Well, I, I, I take a different view on that, on that, yeah, on that one sure. point. In particular, if, you know, if you're going to have a, a, a small room of people where you're going to have that type of conversation, of course they're going to tell you it's not a deterrent. But actually, if you have a wider uh, 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 viewpoint, it's going to, it's going to be a, I think it will give a lot, lot uh, quicker results over a shorter period of time than if you choose not to do anything at all, which is exactly what has happened over the last 15 years. This has been getting worse and worse and worse. All right. You stop there. Uh, uh, yeah. And we must bring this to an end and go on to another question in a moment, but yes. Sure, so I have uh, a couple of points here. One, okay. I was, um, one, I was working as a very junior doctor in King's, one of those hospitals where there were quite a few people who were stabbed, um, young black kids quite often. Um, and what went through their head was, you know, it, it, it was the same sort of stuff that goes through every kid's head. It's much like Professor Peterson was talking about, it is status, it's not really about protection that much, but perhaps there was an element of it at times. Um, I myself, when I was a lot younger, had a lot of friends that carried knives in the Middle East. No one got stabbed, really, but it was done because knives were freely available. Now, um, I just wanted to say, I've been stopped and searched myself uh, on Georgia Road in Croydon. It wasn't pleasant when I was 17 or 18, but unfortunately, tough love works. That's how Giuliani fixed everything. It was a broken windows policy that worked ultimately and actually on the street that I was stopped searched ironically um, there were two stabbings in the last few months one was actually at my uncle's doorstep and there were flowers outside he couldn't get home from work and you think um, stop and search should be extended really should I'm, be used yes, as the, as the I th main I think it's unpleasant deterrent. yes I think it's unpleasant if it happens to you it was unpleasant for me at the time but I think it's it is effective it is one of the few things so, Briefly, Jordan. well, there is something useful to say about punishment. Um, harshness actually doesn't seem to be much of a deterrent because people don't think they'll get caught. 
but likelihood of punishment is a deterrent. Mm, so if you can increase the probability that people who do engage in these crimes are definitely caught and yeah. prosecuted, so people know that they're not going to get away with it, that actually does have an effect on reduction of crime. That makes... And that's about policing and resources. Ms. Hulsk, if you're back to... It's very easy that. to say... The, the issue about stop and search, we can get fixated with stop, stop and search, but the, the issue about stop and search was also about allowing the police to do their job because in many of the instances it, the police were the ones who wanted the stop and search powers. So it's one thing to say, OK, we've got to give them more resources, but you've also got to give them the chance to do their job. Yeah, but, I, but look, in Ireland we have a problem. Uh, people in rural areas feel quite vulnerable from robberies and burglaries and, and a lot of the community are saying in my parties in government we need more resources for policing. And you're right about if people think they'll be caught, they're less likely to do it. So I think we've come back full circle on this, which is a difficult government or political decision to provide resources. And I speak to myself as I'm speaking to you about it, because I think all societies have this problem, notwithstanding knowing what causes it. And I'm, I worry that we haven't talked about why are people angry? What drives somebody? One thing to carry a knife, but another to actually use a knife. What drives you to that? That's, that's quite scary. Well, on that note, we have to move on to another, another issue. Thank you very much. Um, we could debate this right through the programme, I think, but we'd better not because we've got lots and lots of questions. Um, just to say, we're going to be in Milford Haven this time next week, and the week after that we're in Cannock, and if you would like to come to Milford Haven programme or to the Cannock programme, the address is on the screen there, and I'll give the details in full again at, at the end. And Trainer, can we have your question, please? Is there any deal which Mrs May can bring back from Brussels which will both unite the country and gain parliamentary approval? Any deal that can be brought back. <laughs> Mairead McGuinness. OK, well, I'm not British. I'm Irish. I'm in the European Parliament. I hope there is, because I think we are in pretty um, scary times. Um, you know, we've just come from a very serious topic, but Brexit is a really serious issue for the United Kingdom and for the European Union. Um, the last time I appeared in this programme was March. We had a draft withdrawal agreement. I, I'm, I'm fearful that we haven't actually moved forward very much, even though the <coughs> negotiations are ongoing. That's about the best I can say, is that people are still talking. I mean, we hear the figure, 95% of the withdrawal agreement is complete. But actually, the big issue remains unresolved. And we heard last weekend of you know, the newspapers reporting that a deal was, was done. And frankly, every time that the British press reports that a deal is done, I know it isn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I don't say that. No, I don't mean it in that way, David, but it's just been true. But that can is you, the can you, can you the see any. The, the 5% is Ireland, yes? The, the, yeah, and, yeah. You're, and you're a border, you're I, a border I woman. I represent a border constituency. Exactly. What, yes, can a, you a border see woman. Any... I haven't been called before, but I, well, I live in a border region. <laughs> can you um, see any agreement that would satisfy okay. you on the point of keeping the Irish border but between North and South? With respect to the open. questioner, it wasn't yes. about satisfying me, it was satisfying the British public. And, the, uh, and Parliament. And Parliament. And I actually think it was really sad to see how divided this society is, your society, on this issue. Um, and I'm not even going to talk about opinion polls, but what's even more troubling is that we know that the end of March, Brexit will happen. So we have two choices uh, as negotiators. There's no deal or there is a deal. When you ask me, is there a deal that can satisfy the United Kingdom, the fact that we haven't won yet speaks to it being really difficult. And we already have a withdrawal text, which answers the Irish question. And in principle, the Prime Minister has said she wants to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. It's just that the wording in the withdrawal text she doesn't agree with. I've asked several times publicly and privately, for, you know, is there more words? Are there different words? And I gather now there is this talk of a UK-wide customs union. And really, I'm interested to hear what the panel and the audience think about, would that work? Would that unite people? I think it's quite a big concession for the European Union because this uh, earlier agreement was a Northern Ireland specific. And frankly, and I've said this before, that during the referendum campaign, I'm not sure that people fully understood the consequences <coughs> of leaving the European Union, customs union and understand. single they market. The people didn't understand. They did understand. Well, no. Can I just finish this point? Because, well, because okay. on Northern Ireland particularly, this isn't just about um, customs checks and technical issues. We have a very vulnerable society in Northern Ireland that has been divided uh, since I was a child, and that's a long time ago. 
And what I'm hearing now, and this is, you won't hear these people come into this audience or ring radio stations, I'm getting emails from that quiet uh, man and woman who are saying, please be careful, because there is a bad vibe reappearing in our communities between people who, because of you know, the peace process, which we all welcome and work to support, and under the umbrella of European Union membership, could get on with their lives. Equally, we had a hearing this week in the European Parliament where the Ulster Farmers Union came and said, look, Brexit's a real problem for the dairy sector because a big chunk of the milk comes into the Republic of Ireland, gets made into liqueur, travels over the border several times. If we were to have a hard border or a Brexit, as some suggested, then the UK would be a third country and a border it, would Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you a second. You talk about a hard border. Is there anything other than either no border or a hard border, in your view? Well, in I mean, my view, the there will be no border, because I no do border. not think it... I, I, I absolutely am convinced of this. I will have to vote as a member of the European Parliament on this deal, as you will in the House of Commons. And I think if we are respectful to the people we represent and the peace process, which was hard won, and you suffered here in the UK, as people of the Northern Ireland did, as we did in the Republic of Ireland, then we will respect what we have built to date and live up to the principle and All the right. commitments we made. So is there a deal? There is one. Can the British Prime Minister deliver the House of Commons vote? I can't answer that because I'm not in the House of Commons. I hope she can. Right. The next right. question is, what if it doesn't work? OK. Uh, I'll, Kwasi, I'll come to you in a moment. David Aronovich. Um, I wouldn't worry about being Irish here, by the way. Half the mm. people I know, including Brexiteers, will soon be Irish. Um, some of them already are, actually. Some of them already are. I mean, one of, one, one of the things that we've got to get clear, we're just talking about the withdrawal agreement. Yeah. That's all. That's, we're not talking about the big deal. We've taken two and a bit years to get close to getting the withdrawal agreement. And as I understand it, essentially, what the withdrawal agreement will be, if it comes about, is a UK-wide customs uh, union. And the big question is whether or not there is an agreeable form of words to both the European Union and to the British government about how long that will last for and who adjudicates the point at which you actually emerge from any backstop at the end of the implementation phase. Now, you might ask, implement what? We don't know, because we haven't yet got into the discussion of what actually the final deal will be. As I, can see, as I see it now, there are essentially four positions that are now held in Britain. This is, mm. We can take this one back, maybe back to Ireland, the, uh, so for, for, for the edification there. There's the hard Brexit position, which is no deal is better than a bad deal. There's the government's position, Mrs Theresa May, which is uh, a bad deal is better than no deal, because that's essentially what she's going to get, which is a bad deal in her terms and the, uh, and the Conservative Party's terms. There's the Labour Party position, which I understand is an imaginary deal that we can possibly think of, will be better than any deal that anybody else can think of. <laughs> and then... And, and then there is the position which I hold despite everything, which is, let's not do it. <laughs> let's not do it. Am I allowed to do it? We don't... We don't have to. Parliament could vote for a second referendum. It would be problematic. It's not at all certain that the people on my side would win that referendum. It would have to be hard fought for. But I tell you this, the people who are now in favour of remaining inside the European Union learned a big <coughs> lesson in 2016 about how to campaign and about how to make an argument. And we won't be making the same mistake twice. All right. So, we've had two extremely lengthy and good answers about not really answering the question um, which um, the lady posed. I think there will be a deal. Uh, I think that the deal will get through Parliament. I'm confident uh, that we will get uh, something done. And the thing that I am no, I'm struck by in my constituency, uh, which voted 60% to leave the EU, is that most people are bored to their back teeth with this issue. They want to get through it and they want to get on with their lives. And I think that we can get into theological debates, as you witnessed on, on this side. We had very, very lengthy answers, very, very involved uh, debate. And, and we want to move on. I think this idea of a second vote... But you don't want to ignore vote, the issue simply because vote. No. your people are bored, do you? No, no, but well, I think... I think I, if people I, are bored, I, I say, if, they're I mean, bored no, because they haven't no, got a resolution. I, forgive me, can I, can I actually answer yeah. the question? Because you did have yeah, a very sure. long time yes, uh, to, answer your, to answer the lady's yeah. question. OK, but well, you, you, you to say, What I wanted to say is that people want to move on. We've had this endless debate. Uh, what people that uh, want the second vote, they call it the people's vote. 33 million people voted in 2016. Was that not a people's vote? Yes, it 
Was that not a people's vote? There were 33 million people that said, uh, one way or the other, they turned up to the polls and made their view felt. And what David, I fear, is suggesting is that because he didn't like the result of 2016, he wants to rerun uh, the vote again so that the people give him the right answer. <laughs> but the people won't give you the right answer. The people won't give you the right answer. I'm convinced that people want to get this thing through. They want a deal. They want to be able to cooperate with the EU. They don't want to be part of the EU, and they want to get on with their lives. And what about and that's what they point want to do. about Ireland and the dangers of any kind of border between North and South? You asked a very good question when you said, is, there a, is, there, is it just a hard border or no border? And I don't think... I think that's a false... Uh, I think that's a false dichotomy. I think there's a border now. Um, there are different uh, VAT rates. There are different corporation uh, tax rates. Um, but no, it's a There's different no jurisdiction. Border. It's a di different I mean, jurisdiction. What we're suggesting, um, I do, and the idea that the hard border would go back to the 1970s and that we would see that was some of the, the scaremongering that we've seen, that, that we'd have uh, things like in the 1970s and all that gun running and that sort of thing. I think, again, it's just incredible uh, uh, scaremongering and, and exaggeration. All right. I think this is a solvable problem. All right. No, 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 no. You can't. You, you will allow me later, though. I will. I, I, will. I do think it's. I, no, 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 not now. Not now. Not now. Very extensive not now. I'm saying you're bored. No, I'm to sorry. Say I'm saying people are bored. I'm not people bored. Are bored. I'm, I'm right. paid to well, be interested in this stuff. People in my like constituency are terrified. The people are bored. People of Northern Ireland. I think the important thing is that everybody on the panel has a chance to speak. Good idea. Good. Dan. I think the the questioner ask the right question about how do we bring people together. And for anyone that's serious about the politics of this, we have to be able to see through whatever happens, how we actually bring your sure. constituents who voted majority to leave, my constituents who voted 75% to remain, and remind me of it every time I go to the shops, I can tell you. So it's how we bring <coughs> everyone together. Um, David made a good point. They're at the beginning of this process. We haven't got on to talking about trade at all. We're at the very preliminary things that Barnier talked about 18 months ago. The, 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 the Northern Ireland border, the position of EU citizens, and the amount of money we're going to have to pay. And the fact that it's taking this government 18 months to get there is really very alarming. Does Theresa May have a deal that she can unite her cabinet on, number one, get the House of Commons to vote for, number two, and unite the, the country around? Well, if I knew that, I would give up... I'm, You'd be Prime Minister. I'd be Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, I would be Prime Minister. If I knew that, I'd be Prime Minister. But we are... You know, I've been in Parliament for 30-odd years, and I think we are in a very perilous position, and the divisions are really scary. And I think all of us have to think through how, in the end, we bring people together for the good of this country. OK. You sit up there. <laughs> if we get to a position where this uh, referendum from two years ago is overturned and there is no Brexit, then we'll have Donald Trump. Yeah. We Be careful of what you hope for round here. True. Be careful of trying to unwind that referendum because there are 17.4 million people exactly. who will be very annoyed. Be. And down the line, we will get consequences of that which we w will not want. And it might be Donald Trump, it might be worse. All but right. be careful what you want for. So, Diane Abbott, does that, <laughs> does, that, does that suggest to you that Labour should rally round what Mrs May has negotiated when we hear what it is? in the interests of national unity, like some of your colleagues are suggesting? Well, very few of them you'll find. Not <laughs> if it's not good for the country. How could any politician live with themselves if they genuinely thought it was a bad and destructive deal which would, which would damage manufacturing, which would damage the extent to which educational institutions... Oh, I mean, we haven't even actually agreed on the security aspect of it, whether we're going to have access to EU databases after we leave. But no, but no I'll, say this, though. I'll say this, though, about the second referendum, which is, you know, a lot of people are talking about, what I say to people calling for a second referendum now <laughs> is you should be careful what you wish for. Because my suspicion is that if we had a second referendum now, the same people that voted Leave, who are not largely speaking in London, would vote Leave again, saying, didn't you hear us the first time? Absolutely. Okay. John Peterson. I will come to you. John Peterson. Well, some advice from a Canadian, I would say. <laughs> 
like we've, we've just about split our country three times with referenda. And the one thing I would suggest is that it's not a very good way of governing your country. It's like you can't tell when the damn thing... You can't tell when they're binding. You can't tell when public opinion has shifted enough so that another referendum is necessary. You get endless arguments about whether the wording was appropriate. It's like you elect representatives to the House of Parliament to make decisions for a reason. And then when you, when you turn that decision-making power sort of in an arbitrary and unplanned way back to the general populace, I mean, I know they're sovereign and all that, but it's a very bad way of governing the country. And so I think you're in this mess because, well, because David Cameron yeah. abdicated his damn yeah. Okay, you sit on the gangway there. MPs voted in favour of six to one in 2015 to have the referendum. To then pat people on the head and say, you were obviously lied to or stupid, we're not going to listen to you, I would argue is almost the antithesis of what a democratic country yeah. should be. Uh, and, and what's yeah. your view on whether Theresa May can bring back a deal that will unite the country? That's a good question. I personally yes. don't think no deal will be as bad as what a lot of people think. America trades with China under no deal, for example. I don't think it would be the end of the world if that happened. Oh, All right. And, and you, sir, here in the middle there. Uh, two points. Firstly, I think we should be ashamed of ourselves in terms of how we've conducted these negotiations. Some of the comments, you know, uh, Jeremy Hunt's comment at the Tory party conference about, the Europe, about Russia and the European Union are, was absolutely disgraceful. How do you expect the other side to, to give you what you want you, when you behave like that? And secondly, what about the Brexiteers like Owen Patterson, Kate Hoey, who've decided that suddenly we don't need the Good Friday Agreement anymore, even though that Kate Hoey was, was in government a few years ago? I mean, that is just outrageous. Are you, are you uh, fearful about the Irish border? Well, I think, I, th issue? I think that a lot of people didn't really understand it. Um, and then I spoke to Nigel Farage a few weeks ago on LBC, and he said, well, it wasn't discussed in the referendum. A blatant lie. This is what we're dealing with, blatant lies. People pretend it wasn't discussed when it was front and centre of the campaign. All right. And you over there, sir, in the blue pullover, and then I'll come to you behind. Yes. I think what we're dealing with here is what people used to describe as the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. And we are now collectively discovering the pitfalls of the whole process. And so I think Theresa May's chances of actually getting some sort of deal that we can uh, unite around are virtually non-existent and we need some other form of recourse and David Aronovich has very kindly suggested um, <laughs> what sort of shape and form that might take. And you're in favour of that, a second referendum? Absolutely. For all its imperfections, and I do accept those, and for all that there were many justified grievances that people who voted to leave had, um, yes. All right. And the, the woman there had... I think that Mary McGuinness made a good point by saying that we didn't totally know what we were voting for. And I'm not saying that people are stupid. It's a complex issue. Even Dominic Raab, I think, has said today that he, he didn't. didn't really fully comprehend how important the um, Dover was to the UK-Calais border. So yeah, which rather surprised people, I think. <laughs> Sharply so, yeah. yeah. It didn't surprise anyone who knows Dominic Raab. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose what's fascinating listening to this debate is that nobody's mentioning the other partner at the table, mm. the European Union. You're still having a debate here about whether you're leaving, even though you voted to leave. <laughs> and, no, I'm not, I don't think it's funny. I think it's frightening. I really do. Because actually, Christmas is coming and March is looming. Mm. And it, there's a legal process that ha takes its course. I mean, I met Michel Barnier this morning because we had a, an EPP Congress in Helsinki. And the European Union has been very transparent and very clear and is trying to be flexible so that we can make progress. My own Taoiseach is trying to be flexible so that we don't damage ourselves. And remember that, you know, pol politicians get criticised, but I take it very seriously that we could damage my country, you can damage your country, and it's almost like self-harm. And when I made the comment, it was not disres disrespectful when I made the comment about people weren't fully clear of all of the issues involved, because it's so complicated. And guess what? I come from a country where we are prepared to vote again. And we're, we're courageous, because we've done it. When we realise, and our politicians have come back and said, look, we need to delve into this issue again, we need to look in more detail. I'm not advocating you do that. I mean, sir, right it's entirely... It's a, I mean, it's not, it's not my call. This is your decision. But if we refer to the lady's question, you have a problem. 
uh, that if the House of Commons supports a deal, first of all, you have to get a deal that you want and that the European Union is happy to mm. agree to. Mm. That's the bit we're not discussing here. And remember, there are com real complications about looking to stay for the UK to stay fully in the customs union as a backstop to a backstop or whatever description we put it. In other words, the withdrawal agreement has got to be done. That 5% might as well be 200% because it's major. It has to be completed. And Europe has moved on that. But there are regulatory issues and all sorts of things that can complicate it. If we don't... Let, OK, let's be Hang optimistic. Let's be optimistic to, an to a because, deal. We get yeah. a deal. If the House of Commons votes it down, then it is your decision as a people what, what happens next. Right. It's your politician's decision. OK. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to another question because we only have an hour and we've got another question I'd like to take. From Ajmal Afzal, please. Ah, uh, yes. Um, the video of the effigy of the Grenfell Tower on a bonfire was offensive. However, is it a crime? And this was the, uh, the people who shared on social media um, the burning of a cardboard model of Grenfell Tower with paper people as well. And uh, the police arrested them on suspicion of a public order offence. And the question is, is what's offensive a crime. David Aronovich. Um, it was a horrible thing to do. These people um, behaved horribly. Uh, if I were their employer, I'd think seriously about whether I necessarily wanted such a person working for me until they'd made a fulsome apology. But should what they do and that form of expression be actually a criminal offence? No. It shouldn't be a criminal offence. We have to think much more, much more deeply than we do sometimes about all these forms of speech expression that different people want to criminalise or want to ban or want to stop or want to prevent in all kinds of situations. We are driving ourselves crazy with finding things that other people say that we can somehow get them banned or stigmatised for doing. And it's, uh, it is actually now be beginning to take up such a large part of our public discourse, particularly in places like universities, which really ought to know better and which should be concentrating on other things, that I think it's becoming a kind of distortion of our psychology almost. It's become a, it's become a way of thinking about how we should discuss and debate things, which I think is really, is really damaging. What are the examples? In terms of universities, for instance, I, I, I have a, a good friend and adversary called Julie Bindle. She's a, a, a feminist, a doughty feminist all over the years, who is being no-platformed, as they called it, has been in numerous places, because she takes the view that somebody who uh, wants to change gender can't just do that by simply saying, that's what I want to do, uh, and she takes that further. Now, that's a view. I might hold a different view, or I might not want to express it in quite the same way that she does. But to, to, to watch the woman going around the place being prevented from speaking is not the way I want to go. We've also, we've allowed the police to get in on this as well, and this is part of the problem. So one of the things the police are doing is now looking at whether people are causing offence. Mm -hmm. It should not be a crime to offend people. Uh, I, you know, it should not be. People offend me all the time. I don't demand that they be somehow... Actually, Quasi offended me earlier. But, uh, <laughs> you uh, offend me all the time. About all right. money. <laughs> uh, but I, I, didn't I let him go on? I did. OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, all right. I don't so want to I let you go I, on. Uh, no, Diane no, no, <laughs> I think that sometimes the distinction between abusive speech and abusive action can be an artificial distinction. You might say, why is it wrong to be abusive about politicians and send them racist and sexist stuff online? It doesn't matter. All their threats will never happen. But Parliament saw one of our colleagues, right. Joe Cox, killed. And that sort of action, it's not necessarily the consequence of abusive language, but it is related to abusive language. On the Grenfell Tower, I, I don't think it should be a crime unless the police uh, learn uh, stuff that I don't know. But please, I met a number of those people who died, in, who, who had to see their relatives die in Grenfell Tower, who ran down those steps over dead bodies from Grenfell Tower. And I think it is... Horrific what was done. May not be a crime, but utterly horrific. If you understand the reality of Grenfell Tower, you know it utterly 
detestable and <laughs> wrong. But the, as I say, you can't just say, well, you can call people packies and niggas, it doesn't really matter. It has no relationship to anything else. That type of abusive language does have a relationship to actions which are genuinely harmful and damaging and cruel. And I think sometimes when people are dismissive about, you know, racist and sexist language, they need to be careful. Because what you do is you create a climate where certain actions become legitimate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John Dixon. Oh, I know in Scotland the police had put up advertisements in the in the tube encouraging people to turn people in for offensive behavior online. It seems to me, for example, if you're concerned about knife crime, then maybe one of the things you don't want to do is have your police investigating offensive speech. And one of the do things I do see happening in the UK as an outsider that's really quite terrifying to me is that there are increasing restrictions put on people's ability to speak forthrightly. and and, and th that, the, that the consequence of that restriction and the criminalization of what hypothetically constitutes offensive speech is going to be a cure that's so much more worse than the disease that we can hardly imagine it. It's a dreadful thing to see that happening in the UK. And so, I mean, people say things that are reprehensible all the time, but we can't always agree on what they are. But to start to criminalize that, that it's hypothetical. Are you saying there should? Are you saying no? Nothing that anybody says should ever be counted as a crime. Racist well, there's speaker. incitement to crime. That should be that should be counted as a crime and has been for a very long time in the in the British common law tradition. But other than that, you should be very careful about what you regulate as speech. Who's going to regulate it? Who's going to define hate? That's the real issue. It's not that there's not hate. There's plenty of it. The question is who defines hate and how is it prosecuted? I'm not. I'm not frightened of forthright speech. I'm quite a forthright speaker myself. But when you talk about who's going to define hate, you want to see the letters and emails I see sure. day after day and tell me that's not hate. I didn't wait a second. Now, hang on a second. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think the. Um... The Grenfell effigy is obviously abhorrent, and I think those people should pay the price in terms of how they're treated in their community and in their workplace. I think at the other end of the spectrum, we've got indignity for indignity's sake. Um, looking at the case of the Southampton Uni, um, represented the other day, wanting to paint over a mural that she had no idea what it meant. I think there's so many more pressing social injustices that people could be pushing for. And actually, if you complain about things like man-sized tissues, that trivialises feminism instead of pushing forward more important matters. Quite Look, I think there's a balance here. I don't think that... I happen to agree with Dan, and I know uh, as a fact, uh, as an MP from an ethnic background, there is a huge amount of abuse. I mean, like, God knows how much abuse you've had in 30 years. I don't uh, actually engage that much uh, in Twitter, partly mm -hmm. as a consequence of this. I don't mm -hmm. see the point in fighting these people. Um, but... Uh, what I would say is that what David said, I think, is absolutely on the nail. Because what you have to consider is, particularly in a university, there are going to be lots of different ideas. There are going to be lots of ideas that people don't like. There will be some ideas that people do like. But I think to start banning and no-platforming a whole range of people, I think, is not the right way to go. I think we've got an open society. We've got a free society. There used to be a place, I think it still exists, Hyde uh, Park Corner. I've walked down there and heard all sorts of views. Uh, views that I found even more offensive than David's views um, earlier. No, surely um, not. And, um, and, and I just walked on by. But I would not want to see a culture or, or a world in which that sort of thing was banned. Um, right, what, OK, what about what uh, Sarah Thornton, the National Police Chief Counsel, said last week, that the police should focus on burglaries and, cr and violent crime instead of misogyny? Do you well, agree I think with Diane that? had a view on, on that, um, which she might come back to. But what I would say is that uh, certainly constituents, people who are worried about crime, are very much worried about crimes against people, against person, and they're worried about crimes against property. That's what they find very invasive, and they want police to spend more of their time dealing with those crimes than wondering about whether a wolf whistle is a hate crime, no. right? which is one of the, the things that was raised a few weeks ago. I'll go to you, and I'll come to you afterwards. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, I think what's criminal is, right, that the people who made that bonfire are getting kind of criminal charges kind of put against them when the people that actually caused all those people to die in Grenfell are not being held accountable. OK, and you, sir? When you consider that they um, have bonfires every year where they burn effigies of politicians and famous people, are we now going to criminalise that as well mm -hmm. and press criminal charges That's against right. people who put up effigies on bonfire night like that um, because we find it offensive, maybe? I know, but I don't think we should encourage it. And I do think there's a link between this item and where we started. I was at a wedding last Friday and the celebrant spoke about courtesy. Nobody can spell the word anymore and respect and it was actually quite refreshing because I think that is the problem that there's an inherent rawness and coarseness and I think politicians we've allowed it we've allowed this sense of they can say anything to you and I'm sure I'm going to get it in the neck on Twitter but I won't be reading it because I need to sleep <laughs> but I mean it's, it's, it's funny but it's not actually funny because it just multiplies so in, I'm a great believer in freedom of speech. I was a journalist, but your freedom to speak shouldn't interfere with mine. And I do think there's a sensitivity and an accumulative effect when you coarsen language. I looked at the president of the United States, his treatment of journalists today um, was, was, was incredibly. And, and when, at a time when journalists are being murdered around the world. So I, I think that while I, I support your um, notion that we shouldn't ban and stop because it goes underground, I think we should try and encourage people to realise that if, you, if you're very coarse in your discourse, whether it's political or in private, it has an effect on society. Uh, are there any words that should be criminal to use? Brexit. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you do put me on the spot. All roads, all roads lead to Brexit. I was taking a well, more with serious Brexit, point. There was well, somebody... Well, with Brexit. There was some, no, well, hang on, hang on. There was somebody fined under the Communications yeah. Act earlier this year because he posed a video on YouTube of a dog mm -hmm. doing a kind of Nazi salute mm -hmm. and he shouted in the background, gas the Jews. And that was... He was fined and it was a criminal prosecution. Is that right in your view? I didn't think that was right, no. I think it was a big mistake. I mean, I followed that case fairly clearly, fairly carefully, and you don't have to agree that what he did was comical or right, but to, to prosecute him criminally was a big mistake, and you're going to pay for it in this country. Today, Diane, we have to stop there, I think. Diane, briefly, just on that. as I would, I would say that type of video with somebody shouting, kill the Jews, is an incitement to racial hatred, and now that's a crime. It's really important. Right. It may be important, but 80, years, 80 years ago today, 80 years ago today, the precursor of the Holocaust happened. The night of the shattered glass, if I got Crystal the term. Knocked, yeah. Crystal knock. So don't underestimate what happens. It's only 80 years ago. And Jews were marched, their synagogues were burnt down, anti-Semitism was on the rise. It's hap this, this sentiment is happening again across Europe. And all right, I, well, I just I, would I'm be really you. worried that people that don't want... realise that. Yes, but all right, fine. But that, that begs the question of whether that language should be criminalised, which is what the issue was. I'm not going to let you speak because we've reached the end of what our... What do you hour. think? I'm really sorry. And... It's not... Yeah. It's, all right, it's not he says joke. it's just a joke. Anyway, we have to stop there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here we are. I'm glad you came from Helsinki to join us. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, time's up. Now, next Thursday, question time is going to be in Milford Haven. Uh, the week after that, we're in Cannock, uh, where we're going to be joined for the first time since she was appointed by the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Karen Bradley. That's the week after next. Our number, 030 So if you'd like to come either to Milford Haven or Cannock, uh, go there or go to our website, which is perhaps simpler. If you want to discuss the things we've been talking about tonight from home, which I'm sure you may want to, Adrian Childs is on Question Time, Extra Time, on 5 Live, BBC 5 Live right now. But my thanks to this panel, to all of you who came to Dulwich to take part in tonight's programme. And until next Thursday, from all of us, good night. <laughs> <laughs>